Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take a seat, we're uh, going to start. And um, it's my pleasure to invite you to this official side event at COP22 on implementing the NDCs to the Paris Agreement, bridging the legislative and policy gap. Don't be confused by the title behind, that's the title of the talk that's going to be presented shortly. Uh, this is a joint side event between the uh, Interparliamentary Union and the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, as with all these events of the COP, we have a hard stop at 1 p.m. And so we're going to try and run on time with all of our uh, discussions and presentations. My name's Bob Ward. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at London School of Economics and Political Science. And we're going to uh, start with a couple of uh, opening statements. One of our uh, speakers is due shortly, and we will have to have some flexibility for when he comes. But when we, what we will start with is uh, some opening remarks from the president of the Interparliamentary Union, Mr. Sabah Chowdhury. Thank you very much, Bob, and uh, very good morning. Let me share a few thoughts with you. First, I would like to welcome you, of course, on behalf of the Interparliamentary Union, which, as you know, is the World's Organization of uh, National Parliaments and uh, the London School of Economics as well as the Grantham Research Institute. Um, I think this is a very important event. It's a side event, but it's certainly mainstream as far as the challenges that we face today because it addresses the basic issue of implementation. And of course, we all know very well that agreements and pledges that governments make are only at good as the extent to which they are implemented. Um, the word gap has found a lot of currency in the discourse on climate change. So we talk about uh, emission gaps, we talk about uh, financial gaps, we talk about ambition gaps, and of course the other critical gap is that which relates to uh, policy and legislation. As a parliamentarian, of course one of our most um, important challenges is how do we translate words into action? Uh, this is an important challenge for parliamentarians. And for that, we need to have the tools, we need to have the research, we need to have the insight, the data, statistics, understanding. And uh, this is where I think uh, today's event really comes in, uh, because we need to take not just decisions, but those which are informed by policy, which are informed by science, and which are informed by research. So these are really the tools uh, that we talk about quite often. And the IPO is very proud and privileged to have this relationship with the London School of Economics. I remember last year also during Paris, uh, we were very happy to be in a similar event. Elena, of course, has been a great resource person for parliamentarians. I remember when we had the COP in uh, Lima in Peru, uh, she had also presented a very useful report. So the report is really a reality check. It helps us to understand where we are. And it is also a compass in terms of action that we take in the future. Uh, it focuses only on the G20 countries, but that, as you know, accounts for the bulk of our emissions. And um, I think this is going to be an important piece of work that we at the IPU are going to share with parliamentarians as to what can be done uh, to close the gap. Uh, globally, of course, we all know that we are looking at about uh, 3.4 degrees Celsius rise in temperature based on the best pledges that we have had so far. So we are still a far way from the aspirational 1.5 or the 2 degrees Celsius. And one of the ways we try and do that is that the uh, nationally determined contributions as pledged by governments is really a policy statement. Uh, there is no legal force in it. So how can you bring that into the realm of legislation in national legislations so that countries can be held to account? And once you've done that, of course, then the other aspect is going to be to push the ambition level because we really need to move to that aspirational 1.5. Uh, 
and that too with a fair degree of urgency. So I think this report is, um, is the perfect uh, context. It sets the context for us to be able to do that in national parliaments. And um, the constitutional uh, responsibility that we as parliamentarians have uh, to protect the interest of the people uh, is what, of course, sets us aside from other stakeholders, because this is something that we are mandated to do. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, the Grantham Research Institute. Uh, they provide uh, great work, outstanding work, and this is no exception. But I'm sure this is just the beginning, and IPU looks forward to being engaged in this process as we try to get more parliaments mobilized and engaged in trying to reduce the uh, the gap that exists in terms of legislation and policy. I'm sure this is going to be a great session. Um, uh, we will be answering questions as, as panelists, and I look forward to interaction from the floor as well. Once again, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saba. Um, so, as I indicated, uh, we're going to have a slightly flexible schedule. At some point, we are expecting Professor Lord Stern of Brentford, Nicholas Stern, to come and make some uh, remarks. Uh, he will probably arrive in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So we're, what we're going to do is move on to the next um, presentation, which is from Alina Avachenkova, who's co-head of policy at the Grantham Research Institute. She's going to present the results of the report that Saba mentioned, uh, which is, uh, we had some hard copies, I think they've all gone now, but it's also up on the uh, website of the Grantham Research Institute. After Alina's presentation, I hope we will hear from Nicholas Stern, and then we will have a panel discussion with our distinguished um, group of uh, lawmakers and parliamentarians here, uh, which will include an opportunity for questions from the floor. But at this stage, I'm going to invite Alina to uh, give her presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some of the work we've done looking at um, implementation of NDC is now that we're one year from Paris. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is firstly to present to you a couple of slides on the recent legislative trends and then I will talk specifically about NDC um, implementation. As you might know, Grantham Research Institute for the past uh, several years has been tracking climate change related legislation around the world. And we have been issuing updates every year. And last year we looked at 99 countries representing over 90% of global emissions. So um, today I'd like to present to you the latest data, which takes account of legislative developments up to date. So if we look at the 99 countries um, that we have considered in the study, um, at the moment there are 855 laws um, and executive policies um, addressing climate change. And so you can see it on this graph, the number of climate change laws has been doubling every four to five years since 1997 then the Kyoto Protocol has been adopted. However, what is interesting at this slide, we can see that the pace of legislative activity has been slightly reducing um, starting from um, the peak year in 2010. Um, so as, as, we, as we can see, the green line shows the total number of executive and legislative acts passed in the 99 countries that we have looked at. And the red line is executive while the blue is um, So what it might suggest is that we perhaps are uh, reaching a critical mass of the um, core of climate legislation policies and perhaps countries are now working in those initial legislative frameworks that they have put in place. Uh, if we look now at the sectoral split uh, of uh, legislation and policies that countries are adopting, um, this slide shows us that um, um, just over half of 58 countries already have frameworks in place which address both adaptation and mitigation. Um, and there are about 16 countries which still have no frameworks in place, neither addressing legisla uh, legislation um, or policies on adaptation or on mitigation. However, what we also found is that 51 countries out of 99 
only have basic adaptation plans which comply with uh, reporting requirements to UNFCCC. So those do not go into real actions at the national level, but only cover reporting. So there is a significant gap. And final trend that I would like to draw your attention to is that the legislative activity is not even in terms of covering sectors. And here is an example. Energy um, electricity production uh, covers about 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is the same share for land use change and forestry. However, if we look at the legislation in those sectors, currently there are 450 laws and policies addressing electricity, while only 181 addressing land use change. So there is clearly a gap in terms of our experience to date, our attention to various sectors, the gap that would need to be addressed in the coming years. Now that brings me then to the report uh, findings that we're releasing today. And what we said to do was, um, you know, now one year from Paris, countries have committed to nationally determined contributions to emission pledges. So what we wanted to do is to look at where are we 12 months from Paris in terms of domestic legislative and policy frameworks in the G20 countries, which cover about 80% of global emissions, and to identify the gaps in terms of future legislative activity. This is just a reminder in terms of what Paris required countries to do, uh, which um, I think you're all very familiar with, but uh, just to set a framework, countries are supposed to communicate and implement their NDCs every five years. Each subsequent NDC needs to be of greater level of ambition than the previous one and reflect the highest possible ambition um, in terms of its absolute level. Um, countries also need to check whether their pledges are in line with the overall goal of keeping warming well below two degrees with a view of 1.5. They also need to develop um, by 2020 mid-term, long-term um, uh, emission development strategies and communicate those to the UNFCCC to put in place MRV provisions and um, importantly to make progress on 2020 actions. So in our study, we specifically looked at those three elements highlighted in red at the moment, which is implement, putting in place and implementing NDCs, uh, ratcheting ambition over time, and progress on 2020 actions. This is the methodology that we have applied. I will not go into too much detail on this and the benefit of time, but you can see in, in your report, just very briefly in terms of uh, assessing um, NDC implementation to date, what we have done is look at the target, emission target that the country has put forward in Paris in its NDC, and then consider the national uh, domestic uh, frameworks in terms of um, key legislation and executive policies in place, and compare the targets which are built into those domestic frameworks to those communicated in the NDC. And we have compared them for three points of view. Firstly, the level of the target. Does domestic framework uh, at the moment contain the target at the same level as NDC, or does it fall short? Secondly, the scope of the target. If, if countries has communicated, which most G20 countries have done, do they have a framework at the domestic level which sets an economy-wide um, signal um, to the emissions and finally the time frame most NDCs go to 2025 or 2030 does the domestic framework reflect that or is there a gap so that's the first uh, assessment the second is uh, looking at the progress of 2020 pledges made in Copenhagen and in Cancun um, this requirement is not part of the core of the Paris Agreement, but in the preamble, in the decision adopting the Paris Agreement, countries stated that um, progress on 2020 will be key 
for actually reaching objectives for 2030. And here we looked at the um, data by the UNEP Emissions Gap Report, which assesses progress in G20 countries currently in implementing 2020 pledges. And final indicator is ratchet of ambition. Obviously, one year from Paris, we only have first NDCs on the table, and it's too early to talk about ratchet going forward. But what we thought would be useful is to look at the behavior of G20 countries so far in terms of how they've been increasing ambition over time, starting from Kyoto period, and to see which countries would need to step up their efforts now in the context of the Paris Agreement. So this is, this is a framework. Let me share with you some of the key results. But before I do that, uh, one important note is that this assessment is not to make countries, to shame countries or to, to name the winners. What we're really trying to do here is to develop a tool to help policymakers, legislators to identify the areas where more attention is needed in the coming years, because I think this, this is something that is currently needed. So let me show you some of the results. So, this group of four, um, actually, um, well, four, four jurisdictions, including European Union as a region, also France, Germany, and UK individually, came out as uh, fully compliant, of being fully consistent with those three areas that we have considered in the study. So they all have targets at the national level or regional in the case of the EU, which are consistent with the NDC communicated in Paris. They all are on track at the moment with meeting their 2020 pledges. And they have also had a track record of increasing ambition levels uh, consecutively starting from the time of Kyoto. Important though, we do not make the judgment here whether that level of ambition is enough. What we're looking at is merely the trajectory. Has the ambition been increased substantively over time? And then we have three other countries, which are Brazil, China, and Italy, which have frameworks which are broadly consistent with the requirements of the Paris Agreement. They're also all on track with 2020 progress. They've been ratcheting ambition over time, but they do need to adjust the current legislation or policy in place in terms of bringing the target level and the time frame in consistency with the Paris NDC. Important point here as well is that while EU, France, Germany and UK look really good here, each country as jurisdiction is facing their own challenges and I think our panelists will address some of those in a few minutes, but I would just give an example for the European Union, for example, the success of the EU target will be determined by how good um, member states' policies and legislation are at the national level. So this is just the first step. Now let me go to the second group of countries. These are a few which um, we call it moderately consistent, but effectively what we see here is that this group of countries need to um, adjust to their um, domestic frameworks and step up their efforts in a number of areas. Um, for example, countries like Indonesia, um, South Korea uh, and also India will need to consider um, the domestic frameworks currently in place and um, adjust, make adjustments both to policies in terms of the level of the target, which um, at the moment the domestic target is at the lower level than the one communicated in the NDC. They will also need to adjust the time frame of their respective legislation and policies. And then there are countries like Mexico, which um, obviously Mexico has been one of the leaders among emerging economies in terms of driving for high ambition. They've been ratcheting their ambition all the time so far, and they have established a domestic legislation, a climate change act. However, what we're seeing is that Mexico is falling behind in terms of implementation of its 2020 actions, which suggests that while there is political commitment and willingness to move, there is still a gap in terms of perhaps capacities and, um, and frameworks in place. And finally, um, the group of countries where we see the largest gap 
in terms of uh, legislative and executive efforts still required to bring domestic frameworks in consistency with the Paris Agreement. And these countries you could see on this slide include the United States, Australia, Canada, uh, most worryingly, all of these large developed country and large emitters are falling behind on their 2020 pledges. And all of these countries currently lack um, economy-wide framework which would basically guide the national emission profile towards the one pledged in their NDC. So just to summarize, um, I think in this table in the green um, kind of uh, row, you can see constituencies which are broadly, currently have legislative frameworks which are broadly consistent with the Paris Agreement. And as I mentioned, though, with, with, their, with their commitment made to the Paris Agreement, as I said, we're not looking at whether that ambition level is enough in this particular study. In the yellow, um, Brazil, China, Italy, Indonesia, and South Korea, these are countries which have consistent scope of domestic legislation policy, but they will need to adjust uh, the level of target to bring it up to the level committed in Paris. And finally, um, in the red um, row, you see countries where major adjustments would be necessary, as I mentioned earlier. In this one, what we've done then is to look at um, emission reductions um, below business as usual by 2030, uh, which would be expected from the NDC pledges, and basically rated those in terms of the four indicators of consistency with the requirements of the Paris Agreement. And so what we can see is the area which requires most attention is adjustment of the target level and scope. We are currently only 11% of emission reductions um, pledged through NDCs are indeed in countries where we have already domestic legislative frameworks and executive frameworks consistent with the Paris Agreement. So this is one, one area of particular attention. Now to conclude, uh, some of the key messages coming out of this is as I mentioned, um, only four G20 jurisdictions at the moment, which are responsible for about 10% of global emissions, can be considered as being broadly consistent with the three requirements of the Paris Agreement in terms of NDC implementation and um, progress on 2020 actions and ratchet over time as looking backwards historically. We also noted that half of the G20 countries, only half, are on track with the implementation of their 2020 targets. That's obviously a very worrying fact and more effort needs to be put into that. Um, most improvement, as I said, is needed in terms of bringing the level and scope of domestic targets in consistency with the NDC. And also two-thirds of the pledged emission reductions um, by 2030 um, are in countries where currently update is required to the national targets in terms of adjusting their time frames, mostly bringing 2020 targets up to 2030 and adjusting their level as well. Overall, G20 has been increasing ambition over time um, as a group. However, according to the Climate Tracker um, and another um, organization, implementation of climate actions, none of the NDCs of the G20 countries is consistent with the two degree scenario. So we do need to ratchet ambition over time. So I think this is what we wanted to share with you today as the highlights of the study. And as I mentioned, I hope this could be a useful tool in terms of identifying the next steps and where more effort is needed going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you might be aware that this room is becoming rather warm so I'm going to invite you at this stage to remove your jackets or make yourself more comfortable before I introduce the next speaker. I'm certainly going to take advantage of that. Um, <laughs> so we're um, very delighted to uh, have here uh, Professor Lord Stern of Brentford, uh, Nicholas Stern. He's going to uh, 
uh, give us some brief remarks now. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lord Stern is IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government and Chairman of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He is also President of the British Academy and perhaps even more relevant for this gathering, he is a crossbench member of the House of Lords in the UK. So I'm going to invite Nick to take the lectern and uh, give us a few remarks now, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. As um, fellow parliamentarians and fellow academic, academics and fellow enthusiasts for what we're here for. Um, I wanted to first thank the Interparliamentary Union for all the work that it does to bring parliamentarians together. Uh, sharing ideas, sharing ideas is, uh, is fundamental. Uh, sometimes sharing difficulties and frustrations is fundamental too, um, but I'm sure you all approach this in a very constructive and positive way. And I'm full of admiration for the way you get together and for the work you do. And congratulations, congratulations also on the adoption of the action plan on climate, on uh, climate change. And I'm sure in discussing with a number of you over, over the years that uh, when we compare notes and all we compare notes in a structured way, like the report that has just been issued, um, which we're very proud of at the Grantham Institute, that when you compare notes, you sort of do a little bit of ranking to see how far people are along the road. It's very important to do that in a collaborative and sharing way and not in a finger pointing or competitive way. I say that because when you rank universities, as people do all the time, and we're at the London School of Economics and think we're quite good, you get very competitive when you do that. This is not surely the spirit of this one. The spirit of this one is how to share ideas. So share ideas on what? Well, now we've got the uh, Paris Agreement in force, and it's a wonderful thing to have done so quickly. The question now is what we're sharing ideas on. We're sharing ideas first on delivery of promises, uh, or whatever you call them, NDCs, but second, delivery on ramping up, because we know that the NDCs are far less than what we need to do to have any chance of well below two degrees. Um, obviously, the first step is to think about delivery on the NDCs, but you have to, at the same time, think about what that means for uh, ramping up. So it's about creating the national policies. And that, of course, as members of national parliaments, that's the first thing that we think about. And it's very right that that's the first thing we think about. But we also know that the big action is at the city level. We know that that's where the big increases in economic activity, uh, they're already probably 70% of the emissions in, in cities uh, and more than 50% of the population. But we know that's where the increase in emissions are going to take place. And we know that city governments have to be in the lead. States and provincial governments have to be in the lead as well. So even though we're members of national uh, parliaments, I think to understand that local and regional context is extremely important. And I was very struck by um, the four countries that uh, Alina indicated as being some way uh, off a track that could deliver on the NDCs, um, US, Canada, Australia, and Mexico, they're all federal countries. And they're all countries where the federal structure is absolutely critical to understanding how those economies work. And I was very struck by a conversation earlier this week with the uh, Minister of Environment from um, uh, it was like Ontario, I think, Bob, Ontario. And uh, we were wondering, as one or two people have wondered, how the uh, next president of the United States might treat some of these issues, a question which may have occurred to some of you. And he said, well, as you think about that, 
please remember our experience in Canada. He said, we had uh, Stephen Harper for 10 years, on whom I do not comment. But he, during that time, uh, we had uh, Quebec and British Columbia and Ontario actually redoubling almost their efforts because of the stances that the Prime Minister of Canada at that time was uh, taking. So it's a, it was a very interesting remark, and it may be a remark, I don't want to speculate, but it may be a remark that uh, has some relevance. And uh, a number of us have worked closely with Jerry Brown over the years. California, you know, it's, they fiddle around with the numbers, but probably the seventh biggest economies in the world, uh, seventh biggest economy in the world, if it was separate, uh, has been moving pretty strongly in these directions. Um, Mike Bloomberg and Bill de Blasio as uh, mayors of New York have moved quite strongly too. So I think um, as we reflect on the results of this, I think the federalness of um, many of the big countries, and of course there are many other big countries in the world, you know, China and India and Nigeria, and so many that have a very important federal structure. That, I think, should be a big part of our thoughts. And I've already hinted uh, to what I think might happen in the United States. The United States is a complicated place. Actually, all our countries are complicated, but the, uh, it is a country where a number of the states are moving very strongly. Surely that will continue. Where a number of the cities are moving very strongly. Surely that will continue. And if we reflect on the remarks of our friend from Ontario, they might even accelerate. Um, and fine, good. It would be splendid if they did. And lastly, the United States is full of firms that are creative, looking to the future, looking a long way into the future. And uh, those firms, I think, will see where are seeing, have already seen where the long-term future is, and so many other firms will continue to do the same. So um, I think the spirit of uh, Marrakesh is, we've, it's wonderful to have the agreement in place and we get on with it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Nick. And I know you uh, have now got to go on to your next meeting. <laughs> Um, shortly. So um, we'll now turn to um, our panelists. Let me introduce the rest of our panel. We're very lucky to have a uh, diverse and uh, excellent group of um, parliamentarians and lawmakers from around the world. On uh, my far left, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Wilba Otachilo from uh, the Parliament in Kenya. Uh, to his right is uh, Ms. Rosalind Smith, who's a member of parliament in Sierra Leone. Uh, we've of course got Sabah Chowdhury, who is also a parliamentarian in Bangladesh. And we have, um, uh, to Alina's right, we have um, Mr. Joe Linen, who's a member of the European parliament. So we have um, about 55 minutes. I'm going to start by putting some questions to the panelists, but then I will open it up to the floor for you to um, ask questions. So here's an opportunity to think of some questions. Uh, please be aware that this event is being uh, webcast live on the UNFCCC website. So uh, that may affect your choice of question, uh, but more importantly, it means that when I do come to you, um, if you could wait for the microphone, that would be very helpful so that the people who are watching the webcast can also hear your question. But I'm going to start by asking um, uh, Wilbur about the, uh, one of the highlights of the um, Climate Change Action of the last year, which was the uh, passing of the Climate Change Act in Kenya. And I was wondering if you could share with us any lessons you felt that uh, the rest of the world could take from the experience. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Honorable George Haniri, who was supposed to give this uh, presentation, and he volunteered to allow me to give the presentation on his behalf. Um, back to your question, I would like to say that 
climate change is a subject that is of interest to everybody. And Kenya is one of the few countries that suffer greatly due to climate change because over 80% of our land mass is arid and semi-arid. So as a parliament, we took the issue of climate change very serious from the onset. We signed the, uh, the UNFCC um, agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, and as a parliament, we thought it wise to steer the process. And because climate change is cross-cutting, we found the best way to bring everybody on board was to form a caucus. And we formed a parliamentary network caucus on climate change. That caucus brought in all members of parliament, uh, both from the Senate and from, and from the National Assembly. We also found out that as members of parliament, we will not be able to articulate, be on the ground to articulate the e issues of climate change, particularly the impact on the local communities as we are representatives of the people. So again, we made another network to network with the civil societies. Prior to our initiative, we had more than 200 civil societies in the country, all as spearheading climate change issues in various areas in the country. We found that to be very competitive, but yielding a lot of um, expected um, um, impact. So we were able to sit with them and convince them to form one working group which they named Kenya Climate Change Working Group. So for the first time, we were able to bring all the civil societies together. We also found out that we needed the private sector because the private sector plays a major role in the issue of emissions, uh, particularly when you look at the transport, uh, the building sector, and so on. So we also brought in the organizations that deal with the um, uh, private sector, particularly the Kenya Manufacturers Association, the Kenya Private Alliance, and we were able now to come together uh, together to be able to spearhead the issue of climate change as a solid team. And one of the first thing we did after we came back together was to create public hearings throughout the whole country to find out the status of the impact of climate change in various regions in the country. And because members of parliament were involved it had a major, major impact. For every region where we went, it was the members of parliament from that area were tasked to mobilize the people. And during these public hearings, we sat there and we listened to the people to hear what they knew about climate change, how they felt it was impacting on them. And throughout all those public hearings, it was apparent that all the people knew that climate change was having a negative impact, particularly on the agricultural production systems, since 80% of our production systems in the country is agriculture. So as a result of that, through all those processes, we started the process of bringing all those public hearings together and in the process, we reckoned that the best thing was to come up with a legislation that could bring together all of us because we found out that climate change was cross-cutting. And as most of us who know how governments operate, you find that ministries usually have a safeguard against their own domains. And as much as the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources was the one responsible for climate change. But we found out that all other ministries were also doing climate change. And in essence, they were competing. And therefore, it was not very easy to get the ministry in charge to come up with the legislation. We tried to get the ministry to do it. It was not easy. 
So we decided as a parliamentary network on climate, renewable energy and, and climate change to take the challenge and help in the drafting of a bill, which then became a private member's bill, of which I became the pro proponent of that bill. And it's out of that that we were able to push the bill through the parliament. And um, before we, we, we ended the, the 10th parliament, which ended in uh, 2012, we were able to pass the law. But unfortunately, when we did pass the law, there are certain stages that we were unable to go through, particularly the public participation as per the standing orders. So when the law was taken to the president, we had petitions, particularly from the ministries, that they didn't participate much. So they asked that the president not to assent until they participate. So you can see the problem of ministries. It's can real, they can become an impediment rather than an asset. So in the process, again, the president didn't assent to that law. However, when we came again for the, third, uh, the 13th parliament, we took over the, 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 the law again. And all what the president said, he needed just public participation, including the ministries. So in the second round, we got now the Minister of Environment to gazette a task force which included all the ministries plus all the private sector and the, and the civil society. And in that process, we were able to sail through uh, very easily and everybody agreed because already the, the law was there. So that's what happened. And prior to going to Paris, the parliamentary network on renewable energy and climate change in collaboration with the Pan-African Climate, uh, Climate uh, Justice Alliance, we were able to bring all parliamentarians from Africa, the Pan-African Parliament and all other parliaments from other parli uh, parliaments in Africa, in Nairobi, to come up with an African position before we went to Paris. And we took our African position to Paris, and we were happy that most of what we proposed in that African position was approved. When we came back after the Paris uh, Agreement, we were able as Kenyans to conclude the, um, the law. And on, on start of May um, uh, this year, the law was ascended to, and now it's a law and is now operational. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilbur. And I think um, what you've described is a real testimony to the leadership that you personally have taken and your fellow parliamentarians in Kenya. And it provides a lesson to other countries around the world that may be thinking they can't do it. Well, with determination and skill, I think Wilbur's, what Wilbur has described shows that you can get legislation through in many cases. And uh, Kenya has shown exactly that. Um, Rosalind, if I can turn to you next. Um, the uh, nationally determined contribution that Sierra Leone submitted um, has put a great deal of emphasis on building the national institutions that would help you to manage climate change. What would you say are the main challenges uh, for other countries that are similarly highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change? What lessons would you say Liero, Sierra Leone can teach to other countries? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I want to start by thanking the IPU for. Okay. I want to start by thanking the IPU for bringing us here and um, highlighting some of these climate change issues. I want I want to bring you warm greetings from the Sierra Leone Parliament, the Speaker. And I want to recognize the presence of my minority leader. She's also the vice president of the Pan-African Parliament. She's here, Honorable Dr. Bernadette Lai. She's here with us. I want to welcome you to this um, session. I want on the onset to state that Sierra Leone is among the countries that have ratified the Paris Agreement, which was ratified in October this year. Um, Sierra Leone, no doubt, Sierra Leone is being regarded as one of the three 
highly prone countries to disaster. And um, it saddens me this morning to inform this guardian that my constituency has been overtaken by floods this morning with over 100 houses. These are all the effects of climate change. Um, we've lost houses and properties. And as a result of this um, issues relating to climate change, the Sierra Leone government has taken um, climate change as a very serious concern. And they've set up institutions to fight the effect of climate change. We have the Environmental Protection Agency, which is which is now been moved from the Ministry of Lands to the Office of the President. The President is now being briefed daily on activities relating to climate change and the effects of climate change. We've also um, had the National Protected Air Authority. The National Protected Air Authority is set up to preserve our conservation and the forest. The issue of climate change is not limited to the fact that we've seen high rates of deforestation in Africa, the cutting of trees, the cutting of woods. That is why the, environment, the National Protected Area Authority was set up to ensure that we preserve our forest and our wildlife, and also the National Conservation Trust Fund. But the issue of climate change is also a testament to the fact that countries have come together put aside all their differences in the fight against climate change. As you can see, we have over 60 head of state here who have all put their hands together in the fight against um, climate change, which is, um, has been a very, very difficult task for us that living in this planet and even for our children yet unborn. We don't know what the effect of climate change will be if we don't tackle those issues now. The challenges and issues envisage. Some of the challenges are lack of appropriate technology. We have lack of institutional capacity, lack of technological capacity in these institutions, especially in developing countries. We need capacity building. We need to get um, um, the, the right um, technology and infrastructure in these countries. Um, we also need the know-how, the knowledge, the capacity building, the awareness raising. I have listened to my colleague from Kenya, how they take the information to the grassroots. I think every parliament, every country should introduce such practice where we can take the messages to ensure that the people we're representing are, are fair with the, the issues surrounded with climate change. Um, we know that there are in some remote areas in Africa and developing countries, the lack of knowledge. These are all challenges. The lack of knowledge. We must take the messages down to the grassroots. And another problem that we've noticed is the, the, the negotiation, the aspect of negotiation. Most time members of parliament who are the people's representative are left behind. You look at government, government delegations, members of parliament are not part of the government delegations. When these negotiations or the effect of climate change is being discussed, members of parliament are the people's representative. We need to be part of these negotiations. We need to be part of these delegations where these negotiations are made. If you find it difficult to ratify some of these agreements because members of parliament are not aware of these negotiations. They were not part of the process. So when the bills, when these negotiations come to parliament for ratification, sometimes they just sit on the shelf because um, members of parliament tend to protest because they were not part of the, they were not part of it in the beginning. And another factor, another challenge is that climate change cuts across various sectors and lack of synergy between ministries and also lack of coordination. The, 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 the climate change issues are cross-cutting issues. You have the Ministry of Water Resources, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Fisheries. These are all in, um, ministries that are, that are dealing with issues relating to climate change. And there's no synergy between these uh, ministries because everybody, especially when it comes to financing, every ministry wants to champion the issue of um, climate change because there is um, finances tied to it. And another factor that is, um, that is a major challenge also is the lack of financing and the accessibility of the, 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 the climate, the accessibility of the climate fund, the green, the, the climate, the green climate fund. 
it's a major challenge for developing countries because the benchmarks that have been put on accessing these funds, it's inhibiting the, 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 the effect or, or the, the mitigation of climate change in our area. Um, inadequate funding both at national budget and support from donors. These are all challenges in fighting these um, debilitating effects. When you talk about climate change, it's disseminating the information, letting the people know the effect of climate change, what is climate change, how to tackle climate change. If the resources are not there to hold these meetings, then there's a, those are major, major challenge. Political will, the political will also must be there and the political divide. In some countries, in, the, in developing countries, you find out that there's a political divide. When these issues come to parliament, there's a tussle between the, the, politi the political parties what to be um, sometimes, the most times they're in disagreement. And you find out that the majority sometimes overrule and um, they tend to pass the bill. And this is mostly not accepted in, in, in developing countries. It's most time not accepted universally. Fewer women in governance is also a challenge. When you talk about climate change, climate change is an issue that affects mostly women. When you talk about food security, women are farmers in Africa. When the, the, the climate change, the weather pattern has changed, the high, um, the, some, some countries are experiencing drought, it's affecting the agricultural produce. And because it's affecting the agricultural produce, it's creating problem for food security. And also when there's water shortage, you find that the women are most time taking care of the domestic work. They go out, and try to fetch water, to bring water in the homes. And these are major problems when you have fewer women in decision making. The issues of women are not highlighted, are mostly highlighted in this discussion. And weak economy and austerity measures. Sierra Leone has um, instituted austerity measures. It's no secret that our economy has gone really, really bad. And um, you find out that we have. Um, just myself as a member of parliament and um, the Honorable Dr. Bernard Lai, who is he's here from the Pan-African Parliament, because of austerity measures, governments cannot send delegations because of the economic challenges we're faced with as a country. These are, this is not only limited to Sierra Leone. I think the countries that are badly affected by the Ebola are going through the same economic struggle. In addressing um, what can help address these challenges, it's part of the, the B part of my question is what can help address these challenges. I think accelerating practical action convince government to increase budget. This is the one way that can that can that can um, address some of these challenges. You have to lobby across political parties to ensure that when these bills come to parliament, they are ratified, both um, without being um, any disagreement from the other side of the uh, the other side of the aisle bringing in donor communities on implementing or implementing agencies it's very important to bring in donor communities to fight climate change or implementing agencies to help us implement or or address the 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 the, the climate change issues awareness raising is the key as i stated these are challenges we need to beef up and raise more awareness to our local communities both at national local and rural setting, we need to raise the awareness on the effect of climate change and see and make sure that the, the, the message goes down to the people in the rural setting. Exchange of knowledge. Exchange of knowledge is very important. I've learned a lot from my colleague here from Kenya in what they've done and um, it is very good. So um, we need to get more of these workshops, seminars to ensure that um, we get the message down to the people. On that note, I want to thank you very much for listening. I look forward to getting some questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Rosalind, uh, for describing the challenges you're facing, which I think are probably shared by many countries, particularly those countries which are uh, vulnerable to the particularly vulnerable to the impacts and I, I think we should all be sending our best wishes to your constituents who are coping with the uh, flooding at the moment um, I'm going to turn now to Joe Leinen who's a member of the European Parliament um, traditionally the European Union has been thought of, 
of as a, uh, a leader and a, a proponent of strong climate action across the world, uh, but is also now facing a number of other very serious tests and challenges, the refugee crisis, increasing concerns about immigration, and of course, uh, the United Kingdom's vote to leave the European Union. Um, the question is, do you, do you think that this array of other serious challenges facing the European Union will um, make it more difficult for the European Union to achieve its action? Um, and uh, what role can the European Parliament play in ensuring that European Union delivers on the promises it made ahead of Paris? Yeah, thank you, Bob, uh, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm serving in the Environment Committee of the European Parliament, and uh, it's a quite, uh, let's say, dynamic process in which we are uh, in the European Union. Uh, and uh, I can share um, what uh, my colleagues have said uh, from Sierra Leone and uh, Kenya, that it is a long way uh, to go uh, in order to implement uh, targets and, and plans for uh, climate protection. I was myself a leader of a German environment NGO in the 70s. So it's some 40 years ago that some of the countries in Europe have started this debate um, in Denmark and Sweden and Germany and Britain. And um, um, Nick Stern was uh, praising the um, advantage of federations. Yeah, that the uh, uh, U.S. is not only the U.S. Department in Washington, it is California, it is others in Canada, it was Quebec. And therefore, uh, as well in the European Union, uh, as a federation of 28 states, we have uh, that advantage that some are frontrunners and uh, will go on. Whatever happens around us, they have decided to go to a low carbon economy, if not at the end to zero carbon uh, uh, economy. And uh, we uh, need a burden sharing because uh, 28 European states are not the same. So Sweden is not the same like Greece and uh, Germany is not the same like Poland. And we have seen that even the bigger state like Italy is struggling to fulfill uh, the conditions. And therefore it was quite helpful that the EU as a regional bloc joined uh, the UN FCC convention and is part of the Paris uh, Agreement. And I would hope that uh, this could apply to the African Union, to ASEAN, to Mercosur, because uh, as a federative bloc, uh, the front runners are pushing the others to follow. And in the EU, of course, we have uh, the advantage that we are a rules-based uh, bloc. Uh, the EU has no big budget, we have no army, what we have are rules. And by legislation, we uh, expect that all the members are following the rules. And that applied a lot uh, to climate legislation. And uh, no doubt uh, the European Parliament, the uh, People Chamber in the EU is a thriving force against administrations, against lobbies. And um, I think so far we have done a pretty good job. Now, for the pledge for 2020, uh, that looks quite good. Uh, it will be a bit harder for 2030. We have the climate package for 2030 on the table. We are just dealing with um, um, modernizing the emission trading system, uh, the ETS. Um, it has served uh, the purpose, but it is not good enough. It has to get better, especially the carbon price is low as well by the financial crisis um, 28 to 9 where economy came down and then the carbon price came down and um, i hope that we can get a global carbon market uh, california south korea and next year china will uh, as well introduce an ets system so if we could put a tech a price on carbon that will help a lot in industry uh, to readjust uh, their um, uh, investments. Uh, we are now um, busy with the effort sharing, that is the non-ETS sector, the non-industry sector, as to say the building stock, transport and agriculture. And um, as you might know, the EU has promised 40% uh, um, CO2 reduction till uh, 2030. 
uh, many NGOs, uh, Carbon Tracker, you mentioned it, uh, as well as many of us in the parliament think it should be at least 40%. And looking on all the innovations that are on the way, uh, IT uh, appliances, um, uh, the electric transport that comes quicker than we will think, um, uh, then uh, really the renewables that make their way uh, in many European countries, I think we will be better. And the Parliament is uh, really pushing to have now a legislation that can be reviewed in five years and must be reviewed. Uh, look what is possible in five years time and maybe every five years to adjust the legislation to the more ambitious uh, uh, target that you then uh, decide. I had yesterday a meeting with um, Adnin Amin is the director of the IRENA, the International Renewables um, Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi. And uh, last year, they, for the first time, uh, introduced the Legislators Forum for Renewables uh, Legislation. So you are all invited uh, end of uh, January as you are legislators to come to Abu Dhabi. I think it's an amazing story uh, IRENA started six years ago with 16 countries and now they have already 175 countries interested in renewable energies and legislation on uh, renewables um, is uh, uh, important. I can tell from Germany when we had the feed-in law in the year 2000 that paved the way for the renewables uh, in my country and uh, others have uh, followed in, in that way. Now. Um, Yes, we struggle. Um, we have uh, um, Britain still as a member. We don't know when they would leave, which is not 100% sure for uh, my opinion. <laughs> See what uh, that uh, will give uh, in the next one or two years. Uh, I hope they stay in our climate uh, policy package, that they stay in the ETS. Because as I said, we want a global carbon market and keeping Britain in the ETS would be fundamental. We have countries that struggle with the economy as well. If you look on Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, it's not easy for them uh, to follow uh, ambitious uh, uh, legislation. But uh, we have a burden sharing system that can compensate uh, the, uh, let's say, weaker countries with uh, others that then have to do more. And um, what I don't hope is that um, the slogans of the new uh, uh, US president uh, is uh, really having a fruitful ground uh, with some political forces in the European Union. Uh, we have a few climate deniers even in the European Parliament, but they have not been very vocal because they are a small minority. And I see already in the last days that uh, some populist movements, and uh, they are mostly as well nationalists, uh, say close the borders, drive the foreigners out, and make the Trump agenda, that they, uh, they will come more vocal and denying even climate change. Uh, that is a danger. And uh, very often these waves are coming from the US and they touch then the world and Europe as well. So we have an uphill struggle for our 2030 package. Um, it still looks quite good. I think um, by next spring, we will have uh, the basic legislation on emission trading and on effort sharing. And then uh, I hope that we can contribute uh, our responsibility and our share to the global good, which is our common atmosphere and avoid uh, uh, global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And it's reassuring to hear that um, there are uh, members of the European Parliament who remain focused and determined to push forward uh, with climate change action, even at a time when uh, the European Union is facing many additional challenges. Um, Finally, I'm going to invite, uh, before I open it up to the um, floor for questions, I'm going to invite Saba to uh, uh, offer his reflections on challenges facing parliamentarians in Bangladesh. And I'm wondering if um, you feel a particular challenge is getting the right balance between um, uh, action aimed at mitigation and action gained at, 
uh, aimed at adaptation for a country that is so obviously exposed to the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much, Bob. Yes, and I think that's a very fair question to ask, um, because if you look at a country such as uh, Bangladesh and what are the impacts of climate change, then we in fact have the whole spectrum. So if you can imagine a map of the of the subcontinent where Bangladesh is positioned, you have got uh, uh, melting glaciers in the north, in the Himalayas. And of course, the Himalayas are the water towers for the entire Indian subcontinent. They provide fresh water supply for 800 million people. So just think what will happen if the glaciers in fact melt and then you don't have a source of fresh water supply. Now, as those glaciers melt, you have more flooding in Bangladesh because the waters are going to run through Bangladesh into the Bay of Bengal. So to the north, you have the challenge of melting glaciers and to the south, you have the challenge of rising sea levels. And uh, you've probably heard these statistics before, but just a one meter rise in sea level is going to displace 30 million people, three zero million people who happen to be the poorest of the poor. And I was at a, at a side event of the Nordic Council and the population, combined population of all of the countries in that council is around 25 million. So just imagine if all of the population of those countries were to be displaced. Um, we had an excellent uh, meeting of the parliamentarians um, on the, uh, just as this uh, COP was starting off, which was co-hosted by IPU and the Moroccan uh, House of Councillors. And there we had a presentation from the UNEP number of environmental migrants today, and this is within countries and across borders, 25 million. Projected in 2050, 1 billion. 1 billion people are going to be environmental migrants. So the 30 million, of course, is part of that 1 billion that we are talking about. So you've got desertification, you've got uh, salinity intrusion, you've got impacts for food security, uh, changing patterns in rainfall impact on women, child, adolescent health. So this is a country that is facing the full brunt of all of the impacts of climate change. Now, in our um, climate change strategy, we also have a section on mitigation. And I think that is, is what prompting you to ask the question, when you've got so many, you've got full plate, when it comes to adaptation challenges, why are you looking at mitigation? Uh, let me answer that at two levels. The first level is, as Joe just mentioned in his remarks, uh, we may be different countries, but we share one environment, one atmosphere. So I think global solidarity is a very important part of that. So despite being one of the most vulnerable countries, solidarity when it comes to mitigation action, and hopefully this is going to encourage others to do so, especially for whom the challenge is mitigation. And I think you want to be a good international citizen. So that's one. The second is, I think, the related issue of what is the best form of adaptation. You cannot continue to adapt indefinitely. There are natural limits. So mitigation is really, at the end of the day, the best form of adaptation. If you only look at adaptation, you are responding to the symptoms, and you're not responding to the root cause of the disease. So that's why I think this focus on mitigation is important. The other aspect is, yes, we are one of the most vulnerable countries, but we are also one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Bangladesh will make it to the top 30 global economy within the next few years. So for us, we have a huge demand for energy. So it's a very relevant question to ask, how does Bangladesh make this transition? You're responding to your adaptation needs. At the moment, at the same time, how can you be a good international citizen when it comes to your own mitigation challenges? So I think that's why we, we have the two there. And this, of course, is very important because without that, uh, we can't go ahead. So I think as um, Lord Stern also mentioned, you know, the other point I think which is relevant to mention here is the important role of cities. I've talked about Bangladesh being one of the fastest growing economies set to be on a trajectory to be one of the top 30. We also have in the country one of the largest mega cities of the world, which is Dhaka. And now we know that 50% uh, of the global population is living in an urban environment, and cities account for 70% of the global emissions. So for us, it also makes sense to think, well, this is where Dhaka is today with a population of 15 billion. It's probably going to be around 23, 24 million 
in 2025, probably the second largest mega city in the world. So mitigation continues to be a concern for Bangladesh, uh, if not in the immediate term, certainly in the medium to long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saba. And demonstrating again, I, I think it's a, uh, an issue I think that Lord Stern's been emphasizing while he's been here, that in many cases it doesn't make sense to separate out development and growth from mitigation, from adaptation, that those countries that are most successfully tackling climate change recognize that these all come together, particularly when it comes to investment, but often actions that are designed to make uh, countries more move towards a low carbon transition or often need to be coupled with actions to make uh, countries more climate resilient. Okay, we're going to open it up to the uh, floor. We've got about 20 minutes left. Some ground rules before we start. First of all, please wait f when I indicate, uh, well, you're going to be asked to put up your hand if you want to ask a question. When I, if I choose you to uh, ask a question, please wait for the microphone to arrive. When the microphone arrives, please give us your name and any affiliation you want to declare. Questions to the panel are particularly welcome. Uh, if you want to address it to a particular member of the panel, please be explicit. If you want to make short points, that's also fine. But please, let's have no long speeches from the floor. Um, I hope we can agree that. So um, with that, let's start with some questions. Um, let's start with the lady in the middle, and can we wait for the microphone to come? So if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm Vidya Venkat uh, from the Hindu newspaper in India, and I also represent Earth Journalism Network. Uh, I've looked at the summary of the report uh, that was launched today, and I can see that uh, some of the major industrialized countries have not really lived up to their Paris pledges. So I want to know if there are any representatives from these countries here, and I want to hear what they really have to say. Okay, who wants to start? No, uh, I think you have to answer. That was, uh, you mentioned Australia, Canada, uh, the US. I don't know whether somebody from these countries is here. <laughs> Um, in, in, in Europe, it was Italy. Um, I'm not from Italy, so I don't know whether we have Italian friends in the room. In fact, uh, Italy has a lot of government changes. Uh, uh, they had uh, not very stable administrations, and they are latecomers in uh, their legislation. But in the meantime, I think they, they speed up um, going for renewable energies and energy efficiency. Italy is now really speeding up uh, to fulfill their, their obligations. Um, so I don't know whether others want to come in. There is a lady maybe from one of the major economies. Before we open up to a free for all between, the, I'm going to, uh, I think we have a member, uh, Mr. Rialacci, would you like to respond? We have a, uh, Mr. Rialacci is chair of the environmental committee of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. Would you like to make a few comments in response? Uh, if we can have the microphone here. No, io purtroppo parlo in italiano, quindi non so se eh, voi avete le cuffie. Eh? Eh, no, ma loro come fanno però? Eh, allora... Esatto, no, lei parli, faccia degli interventi a pezzetti così io poi traduco. Va bene, diciamo, eh, io non so bene, ho visto i dati, non, ho, non so bene i criteri con cui è stato fatto lo studio. Noi siamo molto indietro in alcuni settori, penso per esempio al settore dell'edilizia, dove possiamo fare molto di più. Eh, per altri settori siamo avanti, noi abbiamo il 40% dell'energia elettrica prodotta da fonti rinnovabili e dobbiamo fare di più rispetto ad altri paesi. Il punto di forza dell'Italia è il sistema produttivo. Le nostre imprese hanno un consumo di energia per una produzione di ricchezza più basso degli altri paesi europei. Okay. 
Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to say that Italy has some uh, good points and some bad points. Uh, I am not sure of, I'm not familiar with the criteria. Oh, so, yes, I'm Ermete Rialacci, chairman of the Environmental Committee of the Chamber of Deputies. And uh, I'm not uh, really familiar with the criteria that were used in the report, the criteria underlying the report, because I was not here at the, at the beginning. But I have to say that we have some strengths and some challenges ahead. When, for example, in the building sector, we are lagging behind, unfortunately, and we can do more in this. And uh, when, it when it comes to the good uh, news, we have to say that we produce 40% of our electricity from renewable sources, and this is good. And this is our strength, and uh, our strength also lies in the productive sector, where uh, the consumption of energy is lower than other EU countries if compared to the wealth that is being produced. Voglio darvi un solo dato per non togliere tempo. Uh, Circa un quarto delle imprese italiane hanno fatto negli ultimi sei anni investimenti in campo ambientale. Questo quarto delle imprese, con l'anno ne ci siamo conosciuti qualche decennio fa, eh, questo quarto delle imprese è quello che in Italia produce più posti di lavoro, circa il 50% dei posti di lavoro, esporta di più, innova di più. Quindi la scommessa che noi pensiamo vada fatta è quella di far capire che della lotta ai mutamenti climatici produce un'economia più forte e che produce più posti di lavoro. Uh, let me give you just one uh, simple figure. Uh, one fourth of Italian businesses over the last uh, six years uh, has been investing massively in the environment. And this one fourth of the Italian businesses actually produce 50% of jobs so in terms of uh, creation of new jobs, uh, uh, this uh, one-fourth of Italian businesses export more, innovates more than other uh, companies. And uh, what we have to say, the message that we want to convey is that uh, the fight ag against the climate change is indeed serving the purpose of uh, economics and uh, employment. Thank you very much, Mr. Eilach, and to your colleague for the instant translation. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to ask, uh, have another question here at the front. If we can bring the microphone to the front, please. Again, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Honorable Dr. Bernadette Lai. I'm the leader of the opposition in the Sierra Leone Parliament and also Vice President of the Pan-African Parliament. I have one question and one short comment. On the issue of cities, uh, Africa is unique in the sense that uh, we are characterized by primate cities, in the sense that we have one big city, normally the capital city, and the rest are really rural areas or very small urban towns. And in the capital city is where we have the most of infrastructure, health, education, and everything. And the inhabitants of the cities survive by the production from the urban areas. But very little goes from the foreign exchange that urban rural areas generate to develop the rural areas, but most of them are in the urban area. So we are having this problem of rural urban migration, especially of the youth. They come there, they don't have skills, they don't have the necessary education, and the populations have overgrown by 10, 15 times the initial population, so that you now have scarce resources. So I'm not surprised that, you know, uh, the emission rate is very high in, in most urban areas. So my question is, with the characterization of Africa, especially with primate cities, how are we going to ensure that uh, we reduce this population? Uh, rural urban population uh, migration, we need to reverse it. Otherwise, the emission rate is going to continue to be high. Then my statement is, uh, I'm happy that uh, PAJA, that is the Pan-African uh, uh, Climate Justice uh, Alliance, is working with the Pan-African Parliament and African Parliament so that we start the parliamentary legislative initiative. 
is going to be very important for climate change. We must come together as parliament to see which parliaments have already have laws on, on climate change so that we know we have a basis to start with. We may be different, but we need to have model laws that every other country can now gen, uh, look at and, and generate. So this is information, and we hope that in the next, by the next COP, uh, we will have several meetings, PAGIA and Pan-African Parliament and parliamentarians bringing together to take a catalog of where are these laws? We're happy that Kenya has, so that we know exactly what resources in terms of laws are on the ground and what we can learn from the processes and the failures. So that as we also parliamentarians start to make laws in our own countries, we will be aware of those pitfalls, but also those actions that are very, very important, you know, in moving those uh, lawmaking process uh, ahead. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for the statement and question. Uh, can I ask one of the panelists to respond to the question, which was about um, the trend towards increasing urbanization. So more than half of the world's population now live in cities. That's now projected to increase uh, rapidly over the next few decades, where we'll be talking about 70% of the world's population living in urban areas uh, by, uh, within the next uh, 20, 25 years. And we also know that these cities are place where most emissions are occurring. So does anybody want to um, take on that question of how to deal with that? Wilbur. Thank you. I think the, re the question she has raised is very pertinent and uh, is a major problem in Africa. And one of the ways we can do is on police, policy ref reform. Uh, in the case, I'll use Kenya as a, a case um, in point in that in kenya we moved away from centralized government system to a devolved government system where now we are allowing county governments small county governments to run their own government uh, their own governments with funding from the uh, exchequer and that allows now the county go uh, governments at the local level to develop their own infrastructure, to enable people create jobs at the local level, rather than this influx of people into the capital city. So change of policy is very important. And we have done this through an action of um, a national constitution, which has changed the government system of governance. Thank you very much, Wilbur. And again, uh, let me just uh, mention some um, remarks that uh, Lord Stern has been making that quite often the policies you need to reduce emissions in cities are also the policies you need to make them less congested, less full of air pollution, nicer places to live, and therefore places where you're more likely to attract the talent for people to come and live in. People do not want to go and live in congested, polluted cities, uh, and certainly not if they are also um, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So um, we've got about uh, eight minutes left. So let's go right to the back. The gentleman with his hand up right at the back, if we can have a microphone there. My apologies to the person with the microphone. I'm asking you to walk back and forth. Right at the back, the man who's standing at back with the blue shirt. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Nisar Chetta, and I work with the Ministry of Climate Change. Can we um, do something about the microphone, please? Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Nisar Chetta, and I work with the Ministry of Climate Change in Pakistan. And I really congratulate Grantham Institute for this fascinating report. And my question is primarily to Joe or Lena, whoever wants to address this, that beside financial reason, this satisfactory legislative response to Paris Agreement has anything to do with the significant presence of uh, parties like Green Party in the Germany, in Parliament and the countries who don't have significant presence, if not the absolute presence or major presence in the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Hello. Yeah, um, indeed, uh, you're right. Um, 
governments are uh, reluctant to go for uh, climate uh, legislation or for climate uh, moves very often. And they are, uh, let's say, under pressure from national lobbies. So you need uh, you need a civil society. And, and in Europe, it was definitely not the governments that moved. It was the civil society. And uh, out of uh, NGOs um, came uh, very often then a party even. But um, I would join uh, my colleague from Kenya, who said that in their parliament, they have created a cross-party caucus for climate protection. If it gets uh, partisan, like you have it in the US now, the Republicans yeah, maybe turn against and the Democrats in favor, you have already lost 50%. And uh, somehow, despite other antagonistic uh, uh, debates you might have in, in national politics, one, one should look for cross-party and trans-party caucuses, because this issue is much too important to be uh, stuck let's say, in the usual traditional uh, party uh, uh, controversy. So uh, you're right. I mean, Green parties have pushed in Germany and elsewhere. NGOs have pushed very much. And in the European Parliament, we have uh, the advantage that we have not by nature a majority or minority. So we are used to work cross-party and even cross-national. That's a big uh, advantage that we have in the European Parliament. I have been in the German Parliament. It's always the same uh, majority against opposition, and uh, you could be stuck if there are not other forces like civil society, public opinion, that pushes, nevertheless, politicians to work together for this uh, historic uh, issue of uh, avoid global more warning more than we have already. Hello, thank you, thank thank you, you very much, so Joe. much. Oh, so oh, I had the mic. I thought I would present this. <laughs> I am um, Christine. I am from Uganda. Okay, I, we, we have four minutes, so please make your questions short and to the point, please. Yes, I am Christine. I am from Uganda. I coordinate the Parliamentary Forum on Climate Change. And uh, the issue I would like to put forward is all of us to look back and look and uh, review our policies. We, as parliamentarians, we have tended to think that we have policies, policies that may be reviewed in some three years or four years. But based on the challenge we are facing right now, we have to review some of those policies. So I just call upon all the policymakers here. Look into the relevant policies, even if the review period was to take place some five years to come, please review and uh, let's get on board to tackle the climate change challenge. And also to think about the parliamentarians as members who can follow up with the implementation from their constituencies, from their voters, not only to sit at that coordination, parliament chambers, they have the other capacity of following up projects within the constituencies, within the uh, population that voted them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think this is the last question. So I'm going to invite Saba to, if he might like to respond to that uh, as president of the IPU. Thank you very much for making that point. And of course, as uh, parliamentarians, one of our main functions is representation. So we have to give a voice to the people. And of course, trying to bring the experience of local constituencies onto the national discourse is very, very important. So I think that representation function, uh, looking at policies, looking at legislation, and not just uh, enacting legislation, also making sure that they're implemented, I think is an important part that uh, of our responsibilities. The other, of course, is making sure that governments are held to account and appropriation of financial resources. I know time is very short, so I'll just keep it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabah. Well, we've got two minutes left. Alina, I think, wants to just make a, um, a final comment about the database. Um, I think in, in one of the comments, it was raised the importance of learning from each other and sharing the information. So I just wanted to bring to your attention the database of climate laws and policies that we have at our web, on our website at the Grantham Research Institute, which are the basis for the statistics I presented at the beginning. And we're currently working with the Sabin Center for International Law at Columbia University to expand the database to, to pull resources 
resources together with them. So we hope um, sometime in, in winter to be able to cover actually 170 countries, not just 99 countries. And you can then search by sector, by country, and find out which other countries might have laws which are relevant to, to your needs. So we invite you to use that resource, which is available online now. Thank you very much, Alina. And uh, let me just end by thanking you all, and perhaps if you could show your appreciation for our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much.